Ads heard during the podcast that are not in my voice are placed by third-party agencies outside of my control and should not imply an endorsement by Weird Darkness or myself. Stories and content in Weird Darkness can be disturbing for some listeners and is intended for mature audiences only. Parental discretion is strongly advised. A canine unit went in to investigate. The first floor was totally destroyed. The second floor was the same as well. The dogs got a scent of something and started to bark at the attic door. The officers opened the door and let the dogs up. Everybody heard the dogs fighting with something. Suddenly, the dogs were thrown out the attic window like rag dolls. They were both skinned alive. The two officers inside went into the attic to see what the hell it was. Everybody outside heard lots of gunfire and then saw one of the officers being thrown out the window. He was dead before he hit the ground. When everybody looked up back towards the window, they saw the creature clear as day. I'm Darren Marlar, and this is Weird Darkness. Welcome, weirdos. This is Weird Darkness. Here you'll find stories of the paranormal, supernatural, legends, lore, crime, conspiracy, mysterious, macabre, unsolved, and unexplained. Coming up in this episode… In October of 1973, two fishermen reported seeing a spaceship, and two extraterrestrials emerged from the craft when it hovered near the ground. Was this a true case of close encounters of the third kind, or was something else going on? The subject of the Netflix documentary Interview with a Serial Killer speaks out in his own chilling words will reveal the killer inside the thoughts of Arthur Shawcross. The two most famous goat-like cryptids cause havoc in their respective American hometowns. We'll look at both the Maryland Goatman and the Pope Lick Monster. Weirdo family member Tyler shares some of the numerous odd things that happened at his house while growing up. It sounds like the woman who used to live there may have decided to return after death to continue her residence. But first, reports have been coming in for decades of hairy creatures in Texas, something like a bipedal wolf or maybe a Sasquatch. Other reports have the creature with no hair at all. Even stranger, whatever this creature or creatures may be, it's not always on the ground that they are spotted, but in the sky as well. We'll begin there. While you're listening, you might want to check out the Weird Darkness website. At WeirdDarkness.com, you can sign up for the newsletter and also get entered into random monthly drawings for Weird Darkness merchandise. You can find paranormal and horror audiobooks I've narrated, a free 24-7 streaming video channel of old horror movies and hilarious horror hosts. You can find my other podcast, Church of the Undead. Also on the website, you can visit the Hope in the Darkness page if you're struggling with depression, anxiety, or thoughts of suicide. And you can shop the Weird Darkness store where all profits I receive go to support depression awareness and relief. You can find all of that and more at WeirdDarkness.com. Now, bolt your doors, lock your windows, turn off your lights, and come with me into the Weird Darkness. There are a lot of strange cases of creatures and entities out there scattered all across the world. Often these accounts have no clear origin or logical answer to explain what people are seeing, and they seem doomed to flutter about in the periphery of the odd. Strikingly, many of such reports describe entities that are humanoid in nature and which serve to defy all attempts to truly classify them. The U.S. state of Texas has more than its share of accounts of bizarre humanoid creatures, and we'll look at a selection of some of the stranger ones. The first report we'll look at here is about as bizarre as they come. 
Paranormal researcher Albert S. Rosales wrote a series of books called Humanoid Encounters, which focused on alleged sightings of various strange entities corresponding to certain years. In the 1970-1974 edition, there is a very odd report from the town of Amarillo, Texas, which supposedly took place in 1970. In the account, the witness claims that he moved into a ranch with his family surrounded by a desolate landscape of sand dunes and very little vegetation. For the first few days at their new home, nothing particularly strange happened, but it took a deep right turn into Bizarreville rather quickly. It started when the grandmother allegedly discovered a den of wolf cubs near the house, but when she brought the grandfather there the next day to show him her discovery, it was found that the adult wolves were dead and the cubs were nowhere to be seen. When the wolf carcasses were examined, it seemed as if they had been torn apart by something very large with formidable claws, and this understandably made them a bit weary as to what was roaming around out there in the wilds. The next evening, the grandfather had a nightmare in which he had a premonition of intense foreboding and a warning in his head to move away immediately. When he awoke in a cold sweat, he went out to the outhouse and, as he did, he claimed to have a hulking humanoid figure with glowing eyes approach him. It seemed to be surveying the house from the dark. Interestingly, the witness's great-grandmother also had a premonition that night, and he would say of what happened thus. Earlier in that very night, my great-grandmother had a terrible feeling and sent my granduncle Ray with his family to check up on his brother. Ray was almost to the house when the car ran out of water. He remembered there was a well nearby and went to get some water. He didn't get too far when the thing with red eyes came in front of him. He ran back to the car and told his family to run to his brother's house. He grabbed his shotgun and bowie knife so he could buy his family time to get away. Ray made sure the car was between him and the creature. The creature charged him quickly. He shot the creature nearly point-blank range several times with no effect. He tried to stab it but almost got slashed by its claws. Then he ran as fast as he could to the house. The creature followed but suddenly stopped short of the hill. By then, the entire family was awake and saw it on the hill staring at them. Grandfather told all the girls to get in the bed of the truck and covered them with lots of blankets and other stuff to make a barrier in case the creature jumped into the bed of the truck. The men were in the cab of the truck, staring at the hulking being. They drove past it, praying it wouldn't attack them. Its gaze was on the house. Suddenly it jumped off the hill and began to chase them. It stopped short of the line where the sand ended and grass began. After this harrowing encounter, they went back the following day to get their things from the house, only to find the ranch owner and numerous police and military-looking people all over the area. On top of this, it appeared as if the entire first floor of the home had been completely wrecked by something. This was all strange enough, but what really makes it even more surreal and off the wall is what happened when a police canine unit was released, and the report says of what transpired thus. A canine unit went in to investigate. The first floor was totally destroyed. The second floor was the same as well. The dogs got a scent of something and started to bark at the attic door. The officers opened the door and let the dogs up it. Everybody heard the dogs fighting with something, and suddenly the dogs were thrown out the attic window like rag dolls. They were both skinned alive. The two officers inside went into the attic to see what the hell it was. Everybody outside heard lots of gunfire and then saw one of the officers being thrown out the window. He was dead before he hit the ground. When everybody looked back up toward the window, they saw the creature as clear as day. It looked like a big, bald, blue-skinned man with big red eyes and sharp claws. The high-ranking military man ordered its destruction. Everybody opened fire on it and the house. Two guys threw grenades into the attic and it exploded. The house was then set on fire. Grandfather and the family left, but later heard that the only body found was that of the other officer. Footprints were found leading away from the house. Nothing of it was ever heard again to their knowledge. It's all completely and insanely bonkers, and it leaves one wondering just what truth any of it has, and if it does, 
than what it was they encountered. The problem is that the account has no real sources listed, so it's unverifiable and could very well be fake. Who knows? Speaking of hulking, terrifying, beastly humanoids, there's another report covered on the site True Horror Stories of Texas, and it involves a witness known only as Jacqueline. She claims that she was on her way back to the town of Cold Spring, Texas after visiting her father in Houston and that she was passing by Lake Livingston Dam at around 10 p.m. when some decidedly weird events would unfold, of which she would say, I was past that light in total darkness with only my headlights shining. I saw something up ahead and slowed down. It was a furry creature on all fours crossing the road. I'll never forget the way it felt, the hair on my arms standing up, and I got goosebumps just remembering. It looked like the boy from the Jungle Book crossing the road with the hind part of the body higher than the front. It stopped just on the other side of my truck, passing a few feet in front of me. It was dark gray and black and it didn't seem to have a face, or maybe it just had too much hair. It was too big to be a dog or any animal. I still don't know what it was. All I know is that I drove off, speeding away looking back into my rearview mirror hoping it wasn't following me home. I locked up and stayed close to my rifle the whole night, and to this day driving through that stretch of road I hope I never see that creature again. What was this thing? Was it, as has been suggested, some kind of werewolf? If it was, then it would not be alone out in the Lone Star State. One of the most well-known of such supposed werewolf reports come from the town of Converse, Texas, where during the 1800s a rancher moved on to a modest plot of land in the area along with his son. One day the rancher apparently sent his son off on a deer hunting trip determined to toughen him up. As he was described as a rather frail and nerdy boy who liked to study and read all day rather than go out into the great outdoors. The boy found himself at a heavily forested area called Skull Crossing, and he disappeared into the woods for several hours. When he returned, he was without any kill, and his father was deeply disappointed with him. For his part, the boy claimed that he had been stalked through the woods by some sort of werewolf and that this was one of the reasons he'd not been able to hunt, but the father did not believe him. He instead made his son turn right back around and go back to finish the job he had started, despite the boy's pleas to not make him go. The young man once again ventured out into the wilderness, and his father stood there waiting. The hours passed and the sun began to set, bathing the woods in darkness, but the boy would not appear from the trees. The father purportedly began to grow worried, and he decided to call upon some locals to go out and look for his son, fearful that something may have happened to him out there. As they fanned out into the increasingly murky forest, they probably thought they'd find the inexperienced lad out wandering about without a clue, but they would soon find out that something altogether more sinister had transpired. According to the tale, the search party came upon a monstrous, hairy beast measuring eight feet tall, which was described as looking like a cross between a wolf and a man, and which was more disturbingly still crouched down and in the process of eating the dead son of the rancher. The party apparently shot at and chased off the monstrosity, which dispersed with supernatural speed. But the boy was dead, torn to shreds. After this, the story becomes a bit hazy, with some versions saying that the rancher went insane and others saying that he locked himself away to wither and die, or that he killed himself. What was this thing, if anything? Was it a real werewolf, a misidentified bear, or something more like a Sasquatch? We will probably never know, and the Converse Texas werewolf remains little more than a perplexing historical oddity. Joining werewolves in the wilds of Texas is what's been described as basically a cross between a man and a goat, and which supposedly haunts the picturesque locale of White Rock Lake. For years, there have been accounts from the area of being terrorized by a humanoid entity that has a body mostly like that of a man, but with hoofed feet, a horned head, and long fingers with twisted, claw-like fingernails. Whatever it is, the Goat Man of White Rock Lake has been seen far and wide and has become entrenched in the local lore. 
Interestingly, Texas seems to be crawling with goat men, and there is another said to haunt the old Alton Bridge in Denton County, and yet another said to prowl the wilds of Lake Worth. Cryptids? Ghosts? Interdimensional beings? What in the world are the goat men? We'll look at a couple more examples later in the podcast. Less identifiable is a story shared by Week in Weird of some sort of creature with glowing eyes that was seen and even photographed at a cemetery in North Houston. In 2013, a paramedic claims that he had been at the Mushk Cemetery in order to take a rest along with his partner at around 2 a.m. As they drifted off to sleep, they apparently heard something roaming about through the underbrush, and when the pair peered into the dark, they were met with the sight of two glowing eyes peering right back at them. The partner apparently had the presence of mind to snap a picture of whatever it was, and this was soon posted to the internet. The picture is distinct and pretty mundane mostly, but there are indeed two glowing orbs in the upper left-hand corner that look like they could be the eyes of something lurking in the woods. A very surreal and most certainly paranormal entity reported from Texas and covered by Glenn Harrison and posted at True Texas Horror Stories is that of a strange creature known as La Malacosa, or rather ominously, the Bad Thing. The entity was first mentioned in Adventures in the Unknown Interior of America, published in 1542, and it begins with the arrival of conquistador Cabeza de Vasa, who during their many adventures came across a native tribe in the Ozark Mountains who told the Spaniards that they had long been visited by a mysterious, bearded stranger who always appeared as rather indistinct and blurry, as if maintaining just a tenuous hold on reality. This stranger was said to carry with him some sort of blindingly bright light, a lantern or wand, which he would wave about in front of him and, in some cases, cause people to faint in fright or under the influence of some arcane force. The appearance of this wandering figure was often accompanied by the discovery of the dead bodies of both animals and humans who appeared to have been surgically operated on, some of their organs removed, and the whole thing stitched back together again. Other tribesmen showed scars or disfigurations that they claimed had been inflicted by La Malacusa in the night. This stranger was also said to appear at tribal feasts or celebrations, lurking in the shadows of the sidelines to merely watch, never partaking in the opulent meals laid out at such events. According to legend, he would never talk to anyone except to say that he was from a place from the regions below. The conquistadors mostly scoffed at such stories, but used it all as a way to convert the natives to Christianity. It is uncertain just what La Malacosa was supposed to be – an ancient spirit, a demon, or even an alien going about performing mutilations, but it is a creepy historical account to be sure. Perhaps even weirder still are creatures not stalking about on the land, but rather through the skies above. Another report was covered on the site True Horror Stories of Texas, this time from near Three Rivers, Texas. In the year 2000, the witness claims that he had been driving along the highway, IH-37, between San Antonio and Corpus Christi at around 1 a.m. He was heading along the interstate, the nighttime scenery flashing by past his headlights, when something odd apparently flew right up out of the night and up over his car. He would describe the weird encounter this way. A large, white humanoid figure with wings, not a crane or a goose or a swan or a bird of prey, but humanoid figure with skin wings. I remember doing about 65 miles per hour, and it came from the right rear and crossed my driving line at about 45 degrees, overtaking me in speed by maybe 5 or 10 miles per hour. As it crossed over me, it was only 10 or so feet above the roof of my vehicle. Wingspan was probably 6 to 8 feet, and the skin was white. The wings looked to be constructed or shaped more like you'd expect to see on a bat or pterodactyl, but with solidly defined human arms on the leading edge. They were definitely human legs trailing behind it, and the torso was built like a human. Because it came from behind, I did not see a face, but looking back, I'm glad I didn't. Another flying humanoid creature that has had plenty of coverage in Texas is the so-called Houston Batman. 
Sightings began back in the 1950s when a bat-like humanoid was seen all over the area by numerous witnesses. The first official sighting happened in June 1953 when three neighbors at the Houston Heights apartment complex saw what they would describe as a very tall man or man-like figure standing about six and a half feet tall with bat-like wings attached to his back. Making it all even stranger was that the entity seemed to be surrounded by an ethereal glow. Ever since then, the Batman of Houston has been seen across the city, often causing witnesses to freeze for no discernible reason and has never entirely been explained. What lies out there in the badlands of the state of Texas? What strange creatures and entities call this place home? We're not likely to find any concrete answers anytime soon, but such accounts serve to get the imagination going. Are these ghosts? Specters, demons, or some sort of interdimensional entities, so-called ultra-terrestrials? The very isolated nature of these reports leaves us scratching our heads. In the end, we can only guess at the nature of such beasts and hope that we do not run across them before ever traveling along a dark road in Texas. When Weird Darkness Returns In October of 1973, two fishermen reported seeing a spaceship and two extraterrestrials emerge from the craft when it hovered near the ground. Was this a true case of a close encounter of the third kind, or was something else going on? And up next, the subject of the Netflix documentary Interview with a Serial Killer speaks out in his own chilling words will reveal the killer inside the thoughts of Arthur Shawcross. You're listening to a Weird Darkness Darkives episode, where I reach back to share an episode with you from years past. If my voice sounds different in this episode, it's because the recordings are older, my presentation style was different, and my voice has naturally gotten lower over the years. For some of you, this will be a nice blast from the past. For others, it'll be new to you with stories you've not yet heard me tell. My goal now is to bring you new episodes of Weird Darkness every Monday through Friday as best I can, and also post a Dark Archives episode, or Darkives episode, every day of the week as well. I hope you enjoy the new schedule. While you're listening, be sure to check out WeirdDarkness.com for merchandise, to visit sponsors you hear about during the show, sign up for my newsletter, enter contests, connect with me on social media, hear other podcasts that I host, listen to free audiobooks I've narrated. Plus, you can visit the Hope in the Darkness page if you're struggling with depression, dark thoughts, or addiction. You can find all of that and more at WeirdDarkness.com. Between 1988 and 1989, Arthur Shawcross killed at least 10 women in Rochester, New York, and they were not his first victims. In a disturbing interview, Shawcross details some of his crimes while vehemently refusing to discuss others. First released under the title Interview with a Serial Killer in 2008, the same year that Shawcross died in prison, the documentary is currently on Netflix and offers a rare glimpse into the mind of a brutal serial killer, even if that glimpse has been filtered through fabrications and fantasies. The first words that we hear Shaw Cross speak in the interview are, People on the outside do not know what evil is. Do you know what evil is? The interviewer asks. Shaw Cross's reply is chilling. Sure. By the time Arthur Shawcross claimed his earliest victims, he had already led a troubled life. The first of four children, Arthur Shawcross was born in Kittery, Maine to Arthur Roy Shawcross and Elizabeth Eurekus Shawcross. When he was young, his family moved to Watertown, New York, where, according to Shawcross, 
he had a difficult childhood. He alleged that his mother performed oral sex on him when he was nine and would even insert foreign objects into his rectum. During junior high school, he claimed to have had sexual relations with his sister. His testimony of being sexually abused as a child are claims that his family has vehemently denied. He was soon considered a bully by classmates and family alike and frequently acted out violently. By 1960, Shawcross dropped out of high school. He had failed to pass the ninth grade. Three years later, he received a probationary sentence after smashing a shop window. In 1964, he married a woman named Sarah. The couple had a son a year later, but a second arrest and probation for unlawful entry soon made their marriage untenable for Sarah. Arthur enlisted in the Army, divorced Sarah, and never saw his son again. Three years after enlisting, Shaw Cross was sent into active duty in Vietnam. Before he left, he remarried, this time to a woman named Linda. In Vietnam, Shaw Cross took advantage of the guerrilla warfare to commit heinous acts. According to his own telling, Shaw Cross went on secret solo missions into the jungle where he engaged in savage acts. In the interview, he speaks frankly about beheading and cooking a Vietnamese woman and eating some of her flesh. When asked what it tasted like, he compares it to steak. The problem is, like so much about Arthur Shawcross, we have no way of knowing if there is any truth in his gruesome and, frankly, unlikely war stories. In fact, according to police, he was not the weapons specialist that he claims, but rather a supply clerk who never actually saw combat. Upon his return from Vietnam, Shawcross came back to Watertown and married three more times. His wives continually left him after a short period due to violent and erratic behavior. Linda divorced him because he was committing arson and burglary. We do know for certain that after his discharge from the Army, Shawcross was arrested for arson and served 22 months of a five-year sentence before being released in October of 1971. Afterward, he returned to his hometown of Watertown. It was on May 7, 1972, that Shawcross lured in his first known victim, Jack Owen Blake, into some woods in Watertown. There, he killed the 10-year-old and, four months later, 8-year-old Karen Ann Hill. Hill had been visiting Watertown with her mother for Labor Day weekend. Both children were reported to have been raped and mutilated. In the documentary, one of the officers describes finding Hill's body, his voice choking up as he recounts that he stuffed her mouth with dirt. Only a month after the murder of Hill, Shawcross was arrested. He agreed to give police the location of Blake's body and confess to the two murders in exchange for a significantly lighter sentence. Shawcross was sentenced to 25 years for the manslaughter of Karen Hill. He was released in 1987 after only 14 years, when staff assessed him as no longer dangerous. The fallacy of this assessment would soon become tragically clear. Between 1988 and 1989, Arthur Shawcross murdered at least 11 women, many of them prostitutes that he picked up along one street in Rochester, New York, where he was living with his fourth wife. Most of them were strangled to death and their often mutilated bodies were dumped in the nearby Genesee River. Shawcross would also return to the bodies of his victims in order to mutilate them further. In one case, he claims to have gone back to a decaying corpse, removed the victim's head, and thrown it into a river. In January 1990, police discovered the body of his final victim, but decided to leave it and keep surveillance on the area as they believed that this killer was one who would return to the scene. Two days later, their theory was proven correct, as a police surveillance team spotted Shawcross standing near his car, urinating on a bridge over Salmon Creek, the frozen waters of which held the body of his final victim. On December 13, 1990, after a 13-week trial, it took a Monroe County jury just six hours of deliberation over a two-day period to convict Shawcross of ten counts of murder. Three months later, Shawcross would plead guilty to the murder of another woman in the neighboring county of Wayne. During his pre-trial confession, 
Shawcross told investigators that for several years he patronized prostitutes that he met in Rochester's red light district, even while he was married. He elaborated on his reasons for murdering the women. One bit him, one was too loud during intercourse, another tried to steal his wallet, and the fourth called him a wimp. While in prison, Shawcross's criminal predilections continued, if in a less murderous way. Eight years after his conviction, he was sent into nine months of solitary confinement after it was discovered that Shawcross was selling his own paintings and autographs on eBay with the help of friends outside. Over the course of interview with a serial killer, we're asked to consider less why than how a man like Shawcross comes to be. How does someone kill so many people with seemingly so little regard for their humanity? When Shawcross was ultimately arrested for his crimes, his defense attempted to mount an argument that he was not guilty by reason of insanity, but the plea was ultimately dismissed. Shawcross was found guilty on 11 counts of murder and sentenced to 250 years in prison. He died behind bars in 2008. In Interview with a Serial Killer, Shawcross demonstrates a consistent and notable physical tick constantly blinking and crinkling his eyes as he speaks. This, in addition to his casual tone when talking about his own atrocities, makes him difficult to read. He never denies what he did, and indeed at times you get the sense that he may be embellishing the details of the murders of the twelve women and his exploits in Vietnam, but he refuses absolutely any discussion of the murders of the two children in Watertown. The documentary ends after Shawcross is reunited with a daughter that he didn't even know he had, conceived while he was on leave from the Army, though it doesn't mention the son that Shawcross did know about, the child that he left with his first wife when he was only 18 months old. Shawcross's daughter and his grandchildren come to visit him in prison and send him letters. When the interviewer asks Shawcross how he would feel if something like what he did to his victims were to happen to his own daughter or her children, Shawcross says that he would be devastated. Yet when pressed about his own crimes, he replies, I don't have any remorse for some reason. When dealing with someone so prone to lies and exaggeration, it can be difficult to get to the truth of someone like Arthur Shawcross, even when we have the terrible evidence of his crimes in front of us. Still, maybe the truth is there in his interview after all. In a follow-up to his question about what evil is, the interviewer asks Shawcross, are you evil? In his typical way, Shawcross replied, somewhat. Nineteen seventy-three was quite a year for UFO reports in the United States. Amidst a countrywide rash of reports where people claimed to see unusual lights and occasionally more structured craft over America, one incident from that year stands out in UFO literature as being one of the most detailed and complex situations ever reported. On the night of October 11, 1973, Charles Hickson and Calvin Parker were fishing together at an abandoned shipyard near the place they worked together. As the story goes, a blue light emerged from the clouds above them, and the men watched a football-shaped object descend and hover nearby, from which two very unusual beings emerged. Hickson and Parker were somehow forced onto the aircraft, in which examinations were performed on them before they were released again bewildered and badly frightened. The two men subsequently went to local authorities and the press, at which time a secret recording was made by law enforcement of the two men privately discussing how terrified they were. Thus, the world soon learned of what became known as the Pascagoula Incident. The details are astounding indeed, whatever they might entail. I say this not with cynicism about the pair's retelling of events, per se, since the details of their story remained remarkably consistent over the years. However, despite being generally a good case as far as the crazier UFO reports go, 
There was never any evidence that the men had conspired as attention seekers, for instance. There are some peculiarities with the Pascagoula incident that are worthy of mention. For instance, as it must be admitted outright that Hickson and Parker's story is quite unlike most other UFO reports. In fact, many aspects of the incident were completely unique and bore no common features with other popular UFO narratives. Chief among these had been the entities encountered during the experience. As skeptic Joe Nickel has noted in the past, three robot-like aliens exited from the craft. Although they were gray humanoids just over five feet tall, they were otherwise of a type not reported before or since. The Clarion Ledger recently reported that Parker, the younger of the two witnesses, has recently authored a book about his experience in which he described the craft as it first appeared to them as follows. A big light came out of the clouds, Parker said. It was a blinding light. It was hard to tell with the lights so bright, but it looked like it was shaped like a football. I would say, just estimating, it was about 80 foot. It made very little sound. It was just a hissing noise. While the craft described by the witnesses is often likened to a blue-colored football, it's important to note how Parker describes it here. In breaking his silence about the incident after all these years, so says the ledger at least, he actually discussed the incidents several times and has seemingly changed or updated aspects of his encounter over the years, more of which we'll discuss later. As Parker says, it was hard for he and his companion to tell precisely what the shape of the object was due to the lights it produced. Additionally, although Parker says the object made little in the way of sound, he does describe a hissing noise, similar to the zipping noises described by the witnesses in previous interviews. It might seem like a stretch to propose that this could have been any kind of conventional aircraft, for example, something man-made. However, it might be worthwhile to compare this part of the narrative to another famous UFO incident from a few decades earlier, that of Brazilian farmer Antonio Villaboas, who on an October evening in 1957 was taken aboard an unusual aircraft and made to have sexual relations with a beautiful woman with large eyes and other appealing assets. Villaboas described the aircraft that appeared on the night in question as being oval-shaped and having made little noise apart from a sort of whirring sound. I recall talking with my friend and fellow writer Nick Redfern about the case a few years back and remarking that Villaboas would have been able to identify the object had it merely been a helicopter. What Nick said in response to this surprised me. Well, hold on, he began. I could hear him ruffling through papers and files over the phone as he looked for his notes about the actual wording used by Villaboas in the description he'd given of the incident, rather than that of the later writings and rewritings about the incident in UFO literature which simply described an oval or egg-shaped object. Sure as hell, in Villaboas's original description he discussed there being something above the oval-shaped craft that appeared to be spinning. In retrospect, the incident sounds a good bit like it could have involved some kind of helicopter, perhaps of a military variety that employs a variety of stealth technology that would lessen the sound of the helicopter blades. This fact has also been pointed out by researcher Mark Picklington in his book Mirage Men. With this in mind, if we give further consideration to Parker's description of the object, where he says, it was hard to tell with the lights so bright but it looked like it was shaped like a football, and that it made very little sound apart from a hissing noise, similarities do emerge between the two incidents. Granted, rather than being definitive details about the two alleged craft, what the similarities suggest is that neither man got a very good look at the actual shape of the object, and in at least one of the two cases, it sounded a lot like a helicopter of some kind. Another interesting parallel between Parker's narrative and the Villaboas incident only came to light years later, when Parker began to express in interviews that he had apparently had additional encounters in the decades following Pascagoula. Parker also made the claim that many years later, his memories of the time he spent on board the aircraft in the original 1973 incident began to return, in which he recalled additional details that included a woman on board the craft, and he was subjected to some variety of sexual examination while there. It's not as far out as what Villaboas reported from his time with a woman on board a UFO, 
but the similarities here are notable regardless. But why did Parker only recall this so many years later? And why so often do these alleged abductions bear elements that involve sexuality in this way? Parker wasn't the only one who claimed to have had ongoing contact with these UFO beings, however. Hickson also claimed to have had numerous UFO sightings the following year, and further claimed that the beings on board the craft communicated to him that they were peaceful. Another lingering question involves why Hickson and Parker seemingly cooperated with the beings that attempted to bring them on board the aircraft. As Parker recently recounted for the ledger, I think they injected us with something to calm us down, Parker said. I was kind of numb and went along with the program. Nick Redfern also has speculated recently about the possible role of mind-altering drugs in some UFO cases. Citing similar ideas proposed by researcher Rich Reynolds, he recently wrote about it, saying, Having known Rich for far more than a few years, I should note that he has a deep interest in the possibility that at least some significant UFO incidents may have had a hallucinogen of some kind at their core. We're not, however, talking about using LSD for recreational purposes. Instead, we're talking about situations which may have been utilized by military and intelligence services to, in essence, fake a UFO event. Faithful devotees to the idea of an alien presence in relation to some of the more bizarre UFO events that have occurred over the years will dislike such speculations presented here. However, the ideas should at least be given consideration, since they are of greater merit than the polarized views of hopeful ufologists that have tossed all their chips in on an extraterrestrial hypothesis or on the other extreme, the all-or-nothing skeptics who argue in every such instance that UFO experiencers are just liars, frauds, or publicity seekers. Neither of these extreme views present a truly objective assessment, something that will be required if we ever to wish to understand the true circumstances behind some of these long-standing UFO cases. Coming up on Weird Darkness, Weirdo family member Tyler shares some of the numerous odd things that happened at his house while growing up. It sounds like the woman who used to live there may have decided to return after death to continue her residence. But first, the two most famous goat-like cryptids cause havoc in their respective American hometowns. We'll look at both the Maryland Goatman and the Pope Lick Monster coming up next. If you like what you're hearing on Weird Darkness, please share it with someone you know who loves the paranormal or strange stories, true crime, monsters, or unsolved mysteries like you do. You can email me and follow me on social media through the Weird Darkness website. WeirdDarkness.com is also where you can find information on sponsors you heard during the show, listen to free audiobooks I've narrated, get the email newsletter, find other podcasts that I host. You can visit the store for creepy and cool Weird Darkness merchandise. Plus, it's where you can find the Hope in the Darkness page if you or someone you know is struggling with depression, addiction, or thoughts of harming yourself or others. And if you have a true paranormal or creepy tale to tell of your own, you can click on Tell Your Story. You can find all of that and more at WeirdDarkness.com. My doc agrees that I need to lose a few pounds. I knew that going in. But he also told me that the meds I'm taking for my type 2 diabetes aren't going to do me much good if I finish each meal with ice cream or cheesecake. I kind of knew that in advance, too. But cutting back on carbs and sugars is, is a lot easier said than done. I've tried a lot of protein bars while on the road, but I swear it's like eating non-sweetened, chocolate-dusted particle board. But now I travel with Built Bars. Built Bars taste like candy bars. In fact, I'm now using them for my dessert. 
and at about 150 calories per bar, less than 3 grams of sugar, up to 19 grams of protein, I could satisfy my sweet cravings guilt-free. Visit WeirdDarkness.com slash Built and try a box. You can go for a variety pack of several flavors to try or pick and choose to build a box of your own. Use the promo code WeirdDarkness at checkout and get 10% off your entire purchase. That's WeirdDarkness.com slash Built. When it comes to urban legends, there is a tendency for certain themes and motifs to reoccur. This pattern has been cited by cryptozoologists and paranormal investigators many times over the years, used as evidence both for and against the truth of the stories being presented. One such reoccurrence is the frequency of stories about goat men, which have been cited in places as varied as Texas and Wisconsin. In fact, stories of goat-like humanoids go back at least as far as the satyrs of ancient Greek myth and have ties to typical portrayals of the Christian devil. But perhaps the two most famous goat-like cryptids in America bear some other striking similarities. The Maryland Goatman and the Pope Lick Monster, who purportedly lurks near Louisville, Kentucky. The Maryland Goatman of Prince George's County, Maryland, has been cited since the 1950s and is probably the best known and most persistent variation of the Goatman story in the United States. Like many other urban legends, the Goatman is fond of lovers' lanes where he's often spotted by teenage couples. The Maryland Goatman is most frequently associated with stretches of Fletchertown Road and Lotsford Road in Prince George's County, areas that were once sparsely populated but nowadays have as many houses and malls as forested stretches for the goat man to lurk. A favorite account claims that the Maryland goat man was once a scientist named Stephen Fletcher, who worked at the nearby Beltsville Agricultural Research Center conducting DNA experiments on goats until a tragic accident led him to becoming part goat himself. The center doesn't put much stock into the legends, though at least according to spokesperson Kim Kaplan, who was quoted in Modern Farmer as saying, I mean, it's so silly, it's not even something that's joked about. But of course, if the center was indirectly responsible for the creation of the Goat Man, they'd certainly have reason to deny their involvement. After all, no matter what their suppositions about his origins, the stories almost all agree that the Maryland Goat Man is bloodthirsty. He is said to roam the back roads, attacking cars with a bloody axe. According to one source, the Maryland Goat Man was blamed for the brutal murders of 14 hikers in 1962, their bodies chopped to pieces while the Goat Man emitted screams that only the devil himself would make. There may not be a lot of evidence to back that one up, but in 1971, a puppy named Ginger was decapitated in the city of Bowie. The incident was covered by the Washington Post, which described the poor dog as having been decapitated cleanly at the neck. The reporter went on to note that the body is not found. While the article itself speculated that a train might have been responsible, some locals quoted in the article pointed the finger at the Maryland Goatman. In spite of its name, the Pope Lick Monster does not, in fact, lick the Pope. I know, I'm disappointed too. Instead, the monster is named for the railroad trestle over Pope Lick Creek, where it is most often sighted. And while the Maryland Goat Man may or may not have butchered those 14 hikers in 1962, the Pope Lick monster has the distinction of being one of the few cryptids in America who is responsible for several documented deaths, however indirectly. Like the Maryland Goat Man, the Pope Lick monster is described as having the head and legs of a goat with a human body and, like the Maryland Goat Man, the Pope Lick Monster is often said to employ a bloody axe, leaping down from the trestle to attack passing cars. Other stories allege that it uses hypnosis or mimics the voice of friends and loved ones to lure its victims onto the railroad bridge and in front of an oncoming train. According to a resident quoted by WDRB.com, 
teenagers would dare each other to cross the trestle at night, saying that the Pope Lake monster would reach up from between the tracks to grab their ankles and hold them in place until they were hit by a train. As to where the Pope Lake monster comes from, like its Maryland counterpart, stories vary. Some say that the Pope Lake monster was once a circus performer who escaped after the train that was carrying it derailed on the trestle, while others hold that the monster is the spirit of a farmer who sacrificed goats to the devil in exchange for supernatural powers. Whether or not the Pope Lake monster is real, it has been the cause of a number of deaths on the railroad trestle running above Pope Lake Creek. Over the years, several legend trippers have died on the trestle while searching for the Pope Lake monster, with the most recent being April of 2016. In spite of legends to the contrary, the tracks are still in regular use by the Norfolk Southern Railroad, who encourage would-be monster hunters to stay off the trestle and warn that trespassers will be arrested for their own safety. Weirdo family member Tyler brings us this next story. My parents bought their house in 1986, the year after they were married. The house's previous owner was an elderly woman and her adult son. The story, as told by the neighbors, goes like this. One day an ambulance came and paramedics rushed into the house. Minutes later, they wheeled the elderly woman out of the house on a cart. She never came back home. When my parents bought the house, they knew they'd have to do a lot of work on the inside. There were such things as velvet wallpaper, shag carpet in the bathrooms, and exterior patio carpet in the kitchen. They'd occasionally find empty beer cans behind the drywall left there by workers who built the house roughly 20 years before. Although my parents have never admitted to any strange occurrences in the house during their early years of owning it, they did say they always wondered if the woman who lived there before them hadn't died at the hospital but rather was already dead when she was taken out of the house. Fast forward some years after my twin sister and I were born. Many strange things began to happen as my sister and I got older. When we were in middle school, our family began to notice that the TV in our downstairs room would randomly turn off on its own. Excuses that it must be the age of the TV were disproved when mom and dad eventually bought a new TV, only to have the same thing happen. These things began to happen with more frequency. At a certain point during our teen years, my sister moved from her bedroom, which was next to mine, into a room in the basement next to the TV room. Almost immediately, we were all unnerved by the stories she would tell us regarding noises she'd hear in the middle of the night. She'd report hearing somebody with slow footsteps walk across our living room floor above her around 2 or 3 in the morning, well after everyone else had gone to bed up on the second floor of the house. One day I had the night off from the cafe I worked at. I was in the kitchen helping my mom make dinner. My dad usually got home around 6 p.m. and we ate right after he arrived. The door to the basement is in the kitchen. Twelve steps lead down to the laundry room. Directly ahead is the door to the garage, and around the corner to your left are four more steps leading down to the pantry, TV room, and my sister's bedroom. Up in the kitchen, my mom and I were working away on dinner when roughly five minutes before six I heard the distinctive sound of the garage door going up. It isn't a quiet door by any means, and you could hear it from anywhere in the house. Neither my mom or I said anything until a few minutes later when my mom said, will you go see what's taking him so long, since he would usually check the mail at the curb before coming in. I figured she assumed he had been caught in a conversation with a neighbor. I walked down to the laundry room and opened the door. I was not met with sunlight. The garage was dark except for the light coming in the windows, and the garage door was closed. Confused, I shut the door. Mom and I had both heard the garage door open, but it clearly hadn't. I went back upstairs and told her. She didn't believe me until I firmly said, Mom, really, it wasn't open. At this point, I believe we all had an unspoken agreement that we weren't alone in the house. Things only started to get weirder after that. 
One night, my sister was taking a shower in the bathroom right at the top of the stairs on the second floor. My mom, dad, and I were watching TV in the living room when we heard a knock on the bathroom door. We then heard my sister's shower still running call out, I'll be done in a sec. The three of us looked at one another, asking why she'd leaned out the shower to knock on the door to let us know. It's not like anybody needed in the bathroom. About ten minutes later, she came downstairs and asked what we needed. We asked what she meant, and she referred to the knock on the door, wondering who it was and what they wanted. You could have heard a pin drop. We all knew it had to be whatever was in the house. All of a sudden, my mom looked around the living room saying, this is my house, whatever you are, go away. A few nights later, I was at the dining room table working on an email to send to one of my professors when I saw movement out of the corner of my eye. From where I was sitting at the head of the table, I had a clear view into the kitchen and down the stairs into the laundry room. I sat there frozen because I could have sworn I saw something move across the laundry room. I elected to ignore it and began work on a sociology paper. About 15 minutes later, I saw it out of the corner of my eye again, this time moving in the opposite direction as before. I froze again. My sister was out with friends and my parents were up in bed sleeping. I got the courage to get up and shut the basement door. I then got back to work. I like to say that's where the night's shenanigans ended. They didn't. Not too long after I'd returned to my chair, I heard the very distinct sound of footsteps slowly coming up the stairs. Now, I'm not sure if it was bravery. It was probably due more to extreme irritation at this point, but either way, I got up again, this time storming into the kitchen where I smacked my hand as hard as I could against the door and said, knock it off. The steps abruptly stopped and I didn't see or hear anything else that night. My sister and I have since both moved out. She lives with a couple friends, and I moved into an apartment with my girlfriend, to whom I am now married and expecting our first child. My mom and dad still speak of strange noises at the house, though. While we don't think whatever it is means us any harm, it seems like it just wants us all to know it's there, whatever it is. Thanks for listening. If you like the podcast, please share a link to this episode and recommend Weird Darkness to your friends, family, and co-workers who love the paranormal, horror stories, or true crime like you do. All stories in Weird Darkness are purported to be true unless stated otherwise, and you can find source links or links to the authors in the show notes. Harry Humanoids of Texas was written by Brent Swanser. Close Encounters in Pascagoula was by Micah Hanks. Inside the Twisted Mind of Arthur Shawcross was written by Oren Gray. Cloven Hoof Cryptids was also written by Oren Gray. This Is My House, Whatever You Are, Go Away was by Weirdo Family Member Tyler. And now that we're coming out of the dark, I'll leave you with a little light. The lions may grow weak and hungry, but those who seek the Lord lack no good thing. Psalm 34, verse 10 and a final thought. Remind yourself, you don't have to do what everyone else is doing. I'm Darren Marlar. Thanks for joining me in the Weird Darkness. At Weird Dark... I can't even say the name of my own show now.